Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is Unpacking Peanuts. We're talking about 1974 today. We are just almost at the halfway point in this magnum opus, and I'm excited to be here today talking to you about it. I'm Jimmy Gownley. I'm your host for these proceedings. You might also know me as the cartoonist behind Amelia Rules, the dumbest idea ever, and seven good reasons not to grow up. Joining me as always are my pals, co-hosts, and fellow cartoonists. He's a playwright and a composer, both for the band Complicated People as well as for this very podcast. He's the original editor of Amelia Rules, the co-creator of the original comic book prize guide, and the current creator of such great strips as Strange Attractors, A Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River. It's Michael Cohen. Say hey. Hey. (laughs) I I almost said hey there. And he is an executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, a former vice president of Archie Comics, and the creator of the Instagram sensation, Sweetest Beasts. It's Harold Buckholz. Who, me? It is. <laughs> so, guys, it, we have read a lot of comic strips. You're not kidding. How many are we at that? Like 8,000 some at I this think point? We are yeah, at probably. the halfway point. Yeah, almost exactly. Almost exactly. Amazing. That is insane i i want to say the thing that has really struck me uh thinking about all these strips and the, this massive time period right we're in 1974 now right so like last year in 1973 the biggest movie in the world or one of the biggest movies anyway was american graffiti and now we're talking about like a, a decade that has happy days on the horizon or actually on the air right yeah. now becoming a phenomenon yeah, i think it was 74 these with are- happy days was 74 with happy days and 73 with american graffiti yeah, it yeah, I think so. that well, time. definitely 73 with American Graffiti. Yeah. So I think it might have been 74 or 75 with Happy Days. But the point being, we're now in the middle of a trend in the 70s that is retro 50s, but it's still actually referencing things that Peanuts predates. Okay, like, you know, Happy Days and, and those and uh, American Graffiti are the late 50s, mm-hmm. very, very early 60s. Peanuts started in 1950. To it, it is such an unbelievable accomplishment to stay in in the in the zeitgeist for so long when so much has changed. And I, I really feel like we've sort of forgotten how hard a job it is to be a daily cartoonist. And you know, it's it's sort of sad that like so many of them are are not even thought about it. I mean, there's very few podcasts that are going through, you know, daily comic strips anymore, but yeah. what an accomplishment. Steve Roper is yeah. probably the notable exception. Well, that's my, well, all right. Spoiler alert here. We are starting <laughs> Roper cast. <laughs> it, it's the only podcast that's about Steve Roper and the TV show, the Roper. <laughs> oh, <no, laughs> and absolutely no Mike nomad ever. <laughs> it's off limits. Uh, so look for that later this summer. But anyway, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's it's a, it's a huge accomplishment, not just for Schultz, but anyone who's doing This is an enormously difficult job to have. Yeah, and and he's he, and how he's grown into it is is phenomenal to see. I mean, it's it, this 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 year in particular. I I just feel like he's he just feels loose, looser and freer in what he's, what he's doing more than we've ever seen. There was always kind of a stiffness and formality originally. And, and he's just kind of in this particular zone that we haven't seen yet, you know, and that's, at least that's the way I'm, I'm interpreting this year. Yeah. It feels like the last few years have been a transition period and now we're into a new sort of, I don't know if plateau is the right word, but a new sort of zone. You know, that's how it feels uh, to me. All right. So, Michael, what do you think about the strips of 1974? Uh, it's definitely drifted into a new terrain. The The change is very subtle. I mean, it's a little hard to pinpoint when and where the shifts came. I think these 70 strips certainly have a different feel than the 60 strips. And there, there's no confusing them. But it's just like Snoopy's evolution, you know, from a puppy and, you mm-hmm. know, through all these different phases of Snoopy's life. You, you don't see the changes 
as you're reading them, but they they happen pretty fast. And so I am yeah, I feel a little nostalgia for the old days, but um I'm trying to keep an open mind on on this stuff, this modern stuff from 1974. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of end of the world stuff. Both uh, there was some last year, there's some this year, and there's going to be even more next year. So um, I'm curious as to what that that's all about. But um, well, we had you know nuclear war was still hovering over us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, I, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the year. I think it's been uh, my favorite probably since the late sixties. What are you guys feeling about? Uh, well, here's my question. Then, okay, we are in a new era. We're in. We have many new characters from where we started out. Different types of values in the storytelling and whatever. How do you guys feel now? Seeing, let's say, those classic four characters versus you know, how they were maybe in the late 50s or mid 60s or something like that. What do you think is the difference between Charlie Brown, Snoopy, Linus, and Lucy? Charlie Brown seems about the most balanced character now, which is, that's a huge change, you know? Yeah. He's he's still dealing with, with that sense of doom and defeat and, and always never giving up. But that's that's pretty remarkable. I was just looking at this this year with charlie brown and he's he's like this anchor like this this anchor for what for this strip that's kind of going off in all these crazy places and that's that's different to me than than the charlie brown before he certainly was at the center of things but it it, it just seems like this i'm not trying to think of the right word but he's he's giving he, he's giving some sort of a, a steadiness to the strip that i really appreciate given all of the amazing, crazy, sometimes totally surreal places Schultz has taken this. Absolutely. What do you think, Michael? I think Lucy's the one who's changed the least. She yeah. might be occasionally a little nicer, but she's still nice and nasty. And I appreciate that. Uh, Linus doesn't, I mean, it looks like Schultz is not quite sure where to go with Linus at this point. And so I think rerun might be a a reflection of that, that he wants a Linus like character. Who's not Linus. Maybe he's played out all his ideas for Linus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's no more big four. I mean, the rule was for our listeners is that the, those four characters were, at least one of them was in every strip, and there were very, very few exceptions to that. Like you, there might have been one Schroeder solo strip, but essentially, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, Linus, and Lucy, one of them or combinations of them were in every single strip, and that's no longer the case. Okay, well, you know, with that uh, out of the way, all that prelude, how about we uh, get into the strip? Oh, no, before we get into the strips, there's other things we need to do. Hey, we got some we got some more uh, listener comments and, and reaction. Yay! So that's good. Uh, one is uh, through YouTube. Okay, so this is from uh, Pui McClary, who writes, Okay, I thought I was the only one using chat GPT for peanuts-related nonsense. Oh, this is uh, in reference to me uh, having uh, concocted a few strips. Now, chat PT- GPT at this point is not able to send out its own messages to people, right? Well... We don't know that yet. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. I asked the chat a bunch of questions, and it kept telling me that the little red-haired girl's name was Marsha or something like that. Mm-hmm. I told the chat that she's called Heather in the television specials, so if in the future chat calls her Heather, it may be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also got a text through the Peanuts hotline. Hey, Liz, what's that Peanuts hotline number? That number again is 717 219 Four one six two. Now, if you if you call that, you leave a message. You can do that, but you could also just text it, right? Now, if you do text it, this is what happened with our uh, next um, correspondent. They didn't tell me who what their name is, uh, so I'm not going to say someone's uh, phone number out there. So, if you want credit for this, <laughs> whoever you are, just text back and, and give me your name. But this is the question for you guys. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. What's the second most fascinating pen nib? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> the second most fascinating pen. Bravo! It's, Bravo, it's the, unknown person. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a 
a question. I'd go with the Hunt 102. I'd say the turkey uh, turkey quill. <laughs> ever, ever ink with one of those hawk quill pens? With the Tony Hawk uh, limited edition? or Limited edition, yeah. <laughs> I, I have not. Michael, do you have a pick for a second most fascinating pen nib? It's probably been 20 years since I used the pen nib. <laughs> Does it mean you're not fascinated by them? <laughs> What was was there a, like a twelve ninety that was super flexible that had like a curved tip to it? Did you ever use that one? I, oh, I know. I don't know the number, but I do know what you're talking about. That had like a brass uh, rather than the steel. It was super yeah. flexible. Um, it was like the one pen nib I I even had a ghost of a chance working with because it wouldn't dig into the paper and spray everything the way Charlie Brown would always do when he's practicing his his penmanship. Well, I just have two things to say about that. One thing, I, I find that hard for me to personally understand because those pen nibs were much more difficult for me because what I would do, because it had that flex, yeah. I would get the big blob of ink. Uh, well, And like the stiff Hunt 102, you know, took my, my roughness a, a lot easier. So you did, a, what did you do with your Hunt 102? What what did you draw with the Hunt 102? Because I know you used it quite a bit. Yeah, a lot of Amelia... I'm not a, actually no. Most of Amelia was the hunt or was the five twelve. That was the early stuff, which was me trying to find something that was similar to the nine fourteen, and then the rest of it was that magic zebra brush pen. But for uh, so you, you, like, you really were looking for the same kind of line you were seeing in in Schultz's work. I, what I was looking for was something that I could draw quickly with, uh-huh. and I thought that was a good way to go because obviously he was doing that but then when i switched all of the shades of gray stuff and then all of dumbest idea and all of seven good reasons were done with a crow quill with the hunt 102 did you uh, find so it fast my, like did you find that a fast no no god okay no, no. yeah I, yeah I, I i was wondering yeah i i had such little luck with with dip pens i could i i got a whole rapidograph set when i was a little you know, I was a teenager. I was like, "Oh, this is exciting!" I don't think I ever once got the thing to work. <laughs> I was rapidographs. Like, if you're not cleaning constantly, they are so finicky. But I just bought the thing. <laughs> was there some trick you're supposed to run some solvent through it or something? I, I was. Oh yeah, I was just terrible. Now I switched. I did go into the brush and did a lot of stuff with brush and found that much easier than pen nibs and and brush it is wow. not easy. Yeah, brushes I find harder. You know, but the second thing I just wanted to say was, other than telling you about my second favorite pen name, is I love the fact that this was a sarcastic question. Uh, <laughs> Yet still, but we talked we about still it for fifteen minutes easily. Oh, easily. I, I don't, I don't know that that was sarcastic. I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> oh. All right, so whoever you are out there, well, well done. All right, so let's get. Oh, to the, I got, uh, I've got one. Oh. I got one. Our, our friend Joshua Stauffer uh, had sent us a question. He says, I don't know how many people have asked already, but what happened to the voting page on the website? Has voting for the strip of the year been discontinued? You know, as we move into the 21st century, we, like many leaders around the world, find voting to be inconvenient <laughs> oh. to our needs and ends. So we've eliminated it. But it's fixed anyway. Yeah, nobody was into voting, really. That's what happened there. Nobody was into it. So, you know what? Too bad. You don't want to use it. We'll take it away. <laughs> oh, golly. Wow. That's Joshua, harsh. you can continue to, to tell us your opinion. That's right. Sure. Yeah. Just... People can hotline us or message us. And if they you know, want to give their their uh, two cents after yeah. we go through the And year, if you're yeah. the only voter, then you win every time. <laughs> that's right. A hundred percent of the vote goes to. What I would say uh, is that we would love to hear from you guys in any way you can. So if you want to do that, you can go to the old Unpacking Peanuts website and where you can't vote, you can email us a letter, a letter. Yep, that's what you email these days, a letter. And we'll uh, answer your questions right here on the air. Or you could follow us on social media. We're at Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. We're Unpacking Peanuts on Facebook. Uh, So yeah, especially as we get into these the second half of the strip is I'm the only one who's read all of it. And I've only read all of it really once, maybe twice, but I think just all of it, I could just say for sure once. So if some of this stuff is your stuff, the stuff you loved and read a thousand times, like we did the earlier stuff, we want to hear from you. Let us know what we should be covering and then what it means to you. So while you're doing that, we're going to start on the strips. Now, if you want to follow us, week by week, what strips we're going to be covering, what you can do is you can go on to what is known as the World Wide Web. 
You might you could find these discs around. They're uh, AOL. You put it in there. That'll get you on the World Wide Web. Then you find a place called GoComics.com and type in Peanuts and 1974. And that's how you'll be able to follow along with us. Now, if you want to know exactly what strips we're talking about ahead of time, then you can sign up at our website for the Great Peanuts Reread. And uh, my good pal, Harold Buckholz, will send you a little newsletter once a month, letting you know what strips we're going to be covering in advance. So, let me interrupt for a second. If they lose their newsletters, uh, the newsletter is posted on the website. Oh, how about that? I learned that. I didn't even know that. So there you go. So you can even get caught up on your old newsletters. This is great. Mm-hmm. We Are we a full service podcast <laughs> or what? We do our best. All right. So with all that out of the way, let's hit it. 1974. Now, I would like to say at the very first strip this year is, is, is a, a rare self-referential strip. Ah, uh, yes. And it is uh, a Peanuts obscurity. Let's just say we, were, we didn't pick this strip, but go for it. Explain it away, Harold. Well, it, it's, it's, it's basically uh, Lucy and Linus are at the t- their TV set and they are watching uh, the Rose Parade. And uh, the question comes up: Who is the who is the Grand Marshal? And and the reply is: uh, it's, it's, you, it's nobody you've ever heard of. Well, the Grand Marshal <laughs> of the parade was Charles Schultz. So oh. uh, Amy was there with him as well. The theme of the Rose Parade was happiness. Is so Schultz obviously knew he was going to do this quite a bit in advance. So he was able to hit on January first that strip. The the morning if they were getting the morning paper, they might be reading that while they had the Rose Parade on, and Charles Schultz was waving at everybody. So that's that was pretty uh, pretty cool, and and in a in a weird way, it reminds me of that that very last strip he did, um, that Sunday strip he he did with some some help um, because he was so ill, and mm-hmm. basically he's talking directly to the readers through through Snoopy visually, but yeah, the the idea that um, he's you always say Schultz is a character in the strip, uh, <laughs> Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Here we are with uh, him in inserting his existence into their world, which I think is pretty cool. Oh, very much. Very much. And that brings us all the way here to January 2nd. This is fun. To me, this is a conversation between Harold and me and Michael. <laughs> So Linus is talking to Snoopy and Woodstock, who are hiding under a sack, and uh, because they believe the world is coming uh, to an end because the comic Kahootek is flying by. Linus says, tell me something. If the world comes to an end, what good will it do to have a sack over your head? Then he calmly walks away, leaving (laughs) Woodstock and Snoopy to contemplate this question. Then in the last panel, Snoopy thinks, I hate questions like that. (laughs) Schultz really has sex on his mind, isn't he? What? <laughs> sex. He's on obsessed his mind. with sex. <laughs> Nothing but sex. <laughs> Boy, the two of you. Last year, Harold's talking about bushes. Now he's obsessed with sex. This is just taking a dark turn. It's unpacking peanuts after dark. <laughs> there's there's so much stylistically interesting in this strip to me. Because you've got this kind of, it looks like the Charlie Brown sheet over his head in, in, at Halloween, except we can see the eyes instead of just the black holes in the two little pupils. And looking at Linus, it's really, really cute. And this little side hump for uh, for for Woodstock. And I don't think a, a paper sack would bend like that. <laughs> Well, does it have to be a paper sack? It doesn't say it's a paper sack. It could be a flower sack. It could be a gully cat sack. Yeah, it's a fa- pillowcase. <laughs> Pillowcase sack. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's. It, I love that the eyes, Woodstock's eyes, are almost as big as Snoopy's eyes. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> I love that Linus asks the question of them and then leaves not asking for an answer. And, oh, right. And yeah, I love no, no, that it was a rhetorical question. It was great. When Snoopy no, turns away from where Linus was, I, I love that uh, that Woodstock, uh, it, it, to help the design, switches over to his uh, his other side, yeah. <laughs> so it's visually more appealing. <laughs> so there's a there's a lot of a uh, lot of artistic choices here that are not obvious, but you just accept them. But it makes for a great strip, and it just it, again, it's, it's Schultz's mastery of knowing what you can do and in. in in visual storytelling. Absolutely. 
January 13th, Snoopy is floating <laughs> alone through the cosmos. In panel two, in, in an abstract uh, first panel. Panel two, he's just lying on the side of his doghouse rather than the top, sighing. Then, at the start of the strip proper on tier two, he's leaning up against his doghouse and he thinks, my life has no meaning. Now he's on top of the doghouse, stressing. Everything seems empty. Now he's perusing his books and he thinks, even my bunny books seem meaningless. Oh no. I search the skies, but I can find no meaning. Then he lies on top of the doghouse and sighs. But then in the next to the last panel, the penultimate panel, if you will, something attracts his attention. He hears something coming. And then in the last panel, we see it is, in fact, Charlie Brown bringing his dog dish of food. And Snoopy says, ah, meaning. Here's the weird thing. I can totally accept him lying on the top of the doghouse and Mm -hmm. typing or having a little bird with his typewriter on top of the doghouse. I cannot accept him lying on the side of the roof. Well, you have you and have not deep slide issues. off. He will deep. slide off. <laughs> I think that little patch on his back is Velcro. It's got to be. Now you understand what I was thinking when. Yeah, but my, our roof was not this steep. <laughs> Michael, you used to go sit out on your roof. Well, during uh, the, the COVID, when we were all locked down, I. Yeah, I'd go up on the roof. I need some sun. Was it an an angle? Yeah, but nothing like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Liz, were you concerned for Michael? There was no way I could have slid off. But this angle, (laughs) yeah. January 21st. Oh, so now we have good old Rerun making some uh, some of his earliest appearances. Uh, in this sequence, he is, and this is actually one of my favorites. I always loved this when I was little. Uh, Rerun is riding on the back of his mom's bike. So that's what our sequence is. And in this one, Charlie Brown and Linus are watching this unfold. And Charlie Brown says, is that your brother, Rerun, riding on the back of your mother's bicycle? Linus says, "Uh uh-huh. She takes him wherever she goes. They watch off panel as the bike speeds by, presumably. She says riding a bike is such good exercise that she's already lost three pounds. Then in the last panel, we see Rerun in his stocking cap with it flying behind him, saying, and through sheer terror, I've lost five. I would have preferred that to be a thought balloon. I don't think when Linus was that age, if he was actually talking, he was, I think, just thinking. That's an interesting thought. Why do you think he he has him speaking rather than... I don't know. Of course, the fact that... Because nothing's as good as it used to be. (laughs) That's true. It used to be a thought balloon. When I was a kid, there were thought balloons. Now Now it's all willy-nilly. Well, and it's also that that Schultz surreality of of a character knowing what another character is saying when you probably couldn't hear him. You know? Right. That's... It just... We accept it. This was animated into in the Charlie Brown and Snoopy show in the mid to er, the early mid eighties. I think it was like eighty three, eighty four, or something like that. And they did a really good job with these sequences, can, especially this next one, which always cracked me up. January twenty fourth, rerun still on the back of the bike, and we can see <laughs> just the very hint of his mom's uh, you know jacket in front of him. And rerun says, "Here we go again, out of the garage and full speed ahead." Today it's Welfare League and a church breakfast. Then it's the League of Women Voters, followed by a visit to the library. From there, we go to the hairdressers and the supermarket and then a rousing meeting of the PTA. Considering I don't do anything, I lead a very active life. (laughs) That's a a line that has found its way into my life over the years. (laughs) Considering I don't do anything, I lead a very active life. (laughs) We have to consider how weird the Van Pelt parents are. They are deeply weird. Get into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is kind of, isn't it? I mean, do people put little babies on the back seat and go? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right now. Oh, God. That was a regular 70s occurrence. That was a thing. Yeah. I, my dad had it on the back of his bike and would ride us around. My friend Jackie Swearheart had to have it on his bike as a kid because he was responsible for lugging his sister Heather around everywhere he went. Oh, wow. <laughs> yep. So I never experienced this, riding in the back of a bike. Yep. Well, I went, going back and looking at that January 21st strip, that you, we see the profile of Linus looking the same direction as the profile of Rerun. And they are pretty much indistinguishable, except that they're wearing different hats. And I kind of missed these strips. I, I didn't, 
I don't remember reading them in the paper. I would have been about, uh, about seven, eight years old. You were more in the financial section at that point. Well, I think I was, yeah, I was trying to see how Technicolor was doing in the stock market. <laughs> so when I would engage with a strip, say from January 24th, I saw someone had posted, I think I said this before, someone had posted in, in our art department at college had posted one of these strips with, with I thought it was Linus. Oh, wow. Because, you know, if you don't have Linus in the strip, he looks just like Linus. So I thought he was in the back seat and I didn't realize that rerun was in the comics. Interesting. Yeah. He never quite, he's always kind of playing around with the, with the rerun design in a way that's, it's not necessarily evolving like the other characters do. It feels a little bit like he's looking for it, mm. you know, right. Really until the nineties. Well, the, the fact that he, ch you would think it might be the other way around, but no, well, maybe not. Could, but yeah, the fact that he chooses to make him look so much like Linus. Obviously, he's a family member. You'd expect they would have similarities, but that there's, there's that, and with and with wearing the hat, he's removed the possibility of of doing something different with the hair. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just weird that I. This is some bizarre version of Peanuts that I didn't experience, where I thought I just totally mistook a character for years, thinking it was somebody I knew. Very strange. February 14th, uh, and this is going to be something that happens more and more, and it's already been happening, but we, we uh, have, uh, we're coming in here in the middle of another sequence. In this sequence, Peppermint Patty has decided that the key to her, you know, success as a student will be handing in a nice typed report. And rather than uh, typing it herself, because she doesn't have a typewriter, she gets her pal Snoopy to do it. And Snoopy, unfortunately, just types a typing exercise <laughs> out for her for some reason. And in this instance, it, it, Pepper and Patty has already got the bad grade, and now she is coming to confront Snoopy. Snoopy, who is sitting up on top of his doghouse with his typewriter. Totally reasonable. Uh, <laughs> totally reasonable. <laughs> no problems here. No physics are okay. And uh, Pepper and Patty comes up and says, what kind of a typist are you? You didn't type what I wrote at all. You've ruined me. I got a failing grade. That was supposed to be my term paper. Snoopy thinks, poor lass, she seems strangely disturbed. <laughs> Patty is very disturbed and is ranting, I'm ruined! And then Snoopy says, probably an unfortunate love affair or something. <laughs> I love that Snoopy goes into his fantasies whenever something like this happens to yeah, him. Yeah, he, so he's just blocking everything. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder why he uh, didn't do Valentine's Day there. Well, the, the unfortunate love affair is in there, so <laughs> mm, possibly. Has he has he consistently been doing Valentine's Days? Well, no. Listen to the podcast. <laughs> well, we don't always pick it. Yeah, I mean, well, you know. I mean, I read it, but I don't remember. <laughs> well, uh, you know, obviously, if he's in the middle in the middle of a story, he's not going to stop to uh to do Valentine's Day for. I hear something for you, Michael. Yes, February sixteenth. Woodstock and Snoopy are sitting on top of the old doghouse. <laughs> then Woodstock, uh, they, they look like Woodstock's thinking. <laughs> Woodstock says something, question mark. And then Snoopy says, a pelican, as we see, because Woodstock does a, an, you have to see it. You just got to look at it. And then <laughs> he does an imitation of a pelican. Then Snoopy rolls his eyes and says, some of Woodstock's imitations can get pretty gross. And Woodstock looks delighted <laughs> at how good he did. And Snoopy's jealous, obviously. Yeah. Woodstock, I mean, that's vulture quality. That is vulture quality. <laughs> and the irony is he was going for Jay Leno. It's really Jay Leno, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> February 20th, Woodstock is saying something to Snoopy, and it's a question. And then the next panel, we see Snoopy uh, reiterating what the question is. Who was the pilot of the plane that took Ronald Coleman to Shangri-La and Lost Horizon? Snoopy says, good grief. Then the last panel, he thinks, I should know better than to play trivia with Woodstock. <laughs> Woodstock has that, that big satisfied smile again. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love that Woodstock is apparently a trivia expert. Yeah, right. I, I don't know how he's getting all his information, but that's pretty cool. It's also very cool. Two of my favorite things come together in this strip. Peanuts and Scarities is Frank. Because he's referring to a Frank Capra directed movie from 1937, Lost Horizon, which is based on James Hilton novel. So this I would include as a Peanuts obscurity in a way. Uh, some people would not know what this is referring to. But yeah, it was a 1937 film. I just watched it actually like in the last few months. It's a great movie. And uh, the pilot is name is Talu. And uh, he, he's a monk in, in the monastery who steals a plane to get Ronald Coleman to Shangri-La. So that's, that's the answer to Woodstock's trivia question. But I had to look it up. Because that oh, is a really tough never trivia, trivia question. Trivia with Harold Buckle. No, that that one uh, he would have gotten me in that. I don't even think they name the character in the movie, so that's really dirty pool would suck. <laughs> you know, hey, just for our, our listeners out there, a lot of times I'll say something like, "Hey, Harold, what do you know about this random thing that no one would know anything about?" And then he can talk about it for like five minutes. I never tell him those things ahead of time. I just spring those on him, and he always seems to know. <laughs> I didn't know this one. Woodstock's really good. He's really good. <laughs> February 22nd. Playing trivia with Woodstock could drive you crazy, thinks Snoopy. Woodstock asks another very long question, which Snoopy reiterates. In the movie Imitation of Life, Claudette Colbert treats someone to a stack of wheats. Who was the actor? I give up, says Snoopy. Who was it? Woodstock tweets at him and he says snoopy thinks i'd forgotten all about ned sparks <laughs> who was in also uh, some other uh, frank Capra movies know. as was claudette colbert so you know this is pretty cool well, all right you know how schultz is ahead of the zeitgeist so i picked a couple of the uh, he's always just a little bit ahead so in the beginning of this year on the second third whatever fourth he's talking about the end of the world as we know it which is an rem song <laughs> the end of the world is being brought about by Kahootek, uh, which is an REM song. Oh, I th- <laughs> Imitation of Life is the first single of REM's 2001 album, Reveal. Wow. So my question is, did Schultz invent alternative rock? <laughs> wow, that's that's impressive. Yeah, I thought I thought Kahootek was 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 some sort of a, a, a children's technology organization or something. What? It was a big thing. See, no, what? Well, there's very little hey, news in those days. So there's a lot of talk about Kahootek uh, in 1974. Oh yeah, there was like doomsday cults. Oh wow. Well, this is one of the things I do want to talk about next year, because I believe it's 75. He does the whole storyline about the camp. Uh, the kids are told the end, world is ending. And I think that has to do with that, the the um, Jehovah's Witness thing. Stay alive till 75. They had predicted the world would end in 75. And uh, I think Schultz, that must have been in his mind, because he's constantly talking about the end of the world in this, this period. Yeah. Well, the end of the world comes every year, doesn't it? Does it? Yeah. No? All right. And then we start afresh. Yeah, you know, it's a beautiful cyclical way of looking at things. February 23rd, in the dark days of December. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> February 23rd. Charlie Brown and Linus are hanging out at the thinking wall. Linus says, I've decided how I'm going to make my fortune. I think my future lies in sports. Charlie Brown says, you think you can make a lot of money by becoming a professional athlete? Linus says, no, a knee surgeon. This strikes me as a kind of retro peanuts. This could have come in just about anywhere in the strip. Yeah. It seems more like a 60s or late 50s strip. With the only possible caveat being maybe there were more injuries because football was much more popular. Mm. You know, and that is definitely a sport where you're getting a lot of knee injuries. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh you know football being very popular at this point but yeah it definitely does have an original peanuts vibe yeah plus uh linus was sort of the smart one so he this is actually in character that he, he'd consider like becoming an md of some sort yeah because he has mentioned being a doctor in other ones right he's gonna be a big famous doctor that's really humble and- did his mom want him to grow up and be a doctor was that part of the 
her her thing. I don't remember it, th- them actually saying like when that. Like putting the notes in his lunch, I couldn't remember if she ever came out and said, you know, I hope you'll be a doctor or a lawyer. No, nah, I don't think so. But yeah, I mean, who knows? Yeah. Again, what's going on? You can on be whatever you house. put your mind to. She was being much more open ended for him. That was nice of her. <laughs> right. March eighth, Snoopy is walking by Lucy, and Lucy is in her. Uh, classic crabby mode she yells you stupid beagle you fat no good worthless hound you flea bitten good for nothing canine she's shaking her fist snoopy walking away thinks that's the trouble with being sensitive even the slightest remark can hurt your feelings (laughs) (laughs) he's not fat (laughs) he's getting a little portly there i don't know he's just big stomach he's big stomach uh, so what do you feel about this design of Snoopy, Michael? Is this st- like like foreheads and other parts uh, included? Uh, I think it's still closer to the older Snoopy than the, the soon to come Snoopy. Mm-hmm. It's just such a really nice design. I mean, the, these the, all of these characters look, yeah, just generally look really, really nice at this point. They, they definitely look looser and... Then, yeah, he was drawing them certainly earlier, but I kind of like the looseness of the line of where he is right now. Yeah, I think it's great. And that is some classic uh, Lucy insults. So that's two in a row that we have that are kind of uh, a bit of a throwback. Yeah. March 13th. So now we're in another sequence. So in this sequence, uh, Peppermint Patty has decided school is not for her and she's going to live the Snoopy life. So she is going to just hang out on top of uh, Snoopy's doghouse with him. So what we have here is is Marcy coming up and trying to put an end to this. So we see Peppermint Patty and Snoopy atop uh, Snoopy's doghouse. Marcy comes up and says, now what are you doing, sir? Peppermint Patty throws her arms around Snoopy, giving him a hug from behind, and she says, I'm not doing anything, Marcy. I'm just going to sit here for the rest of my life with my old friend Snoopy. Marcy implores her, Don't do that, sir. Come down. Come down and go to school with me. Peppermint Patty says, Nope. Then she hugs Snoopy again, saying, I'm going to stay right here because old Snoop is the only one who understands me. Snoopy says, I do. (laughs) Now, at this point, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, she still thinks he's a boy. She discovers it in this storyline. Though so how a boy could have those ears, I don't know. March 14th, our scene continues with Marcy speaking to Pepper and Patty on the doghouse. Marcy says, sir, please come down and let's go to school. If we hurry, we can still make it to second period. Peppermint Patty is having none of it, and with a scowl on her face, she says, I hate second period. Besides, I've already told you I'm going to sit here with Snoopy for the rest of my life. We're just going to sit here and beep each other on the nose, which she then does. Beep! To which Snoopy thinks, Thrillsville 74. I will pick any strip with the word Thrillsville in it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, is this an, an obscurity? Because th- when did they start tagging movies with the subtitle of the date? Well, it goes goes back to the 30s. Does <laughs> it? Know, the gold diggers of 1936 oh, yeah, or whatever. True. But but I think with, with, with just putting the year after it, I think, well, there was Airport, right? Airport and there was, 75 or something, right? Yeah, like, but that was, again, he's ahead of his time. Yeah. Maybe someone saw, that, saw this and goes, that's the way we need to name these movies going forward. Uh, I can't remember a film that just put the year after it until the airport movie which i was it was it 75 was there I one before like that it feels like it's 75 airport 75. there was airport 75 but was there one before that that did a year i can't remember one I'm, I'm, our listeners probably could uh, fill us in airport 75 which came out in 1974 i'm just uh, double checking here yeah because they didn't want the film ever to feel dated so you have <laughs> to put the year ahead well yeah, he we, might have heard about the production in Variety or something. Well, that's true. He was probably getting the trades. <laughs> He's probably Lee Mendelssohn's filling him in. Could just be that it's uh, him using his old punchline again, and it's 1974 when he's doing it. Yeah, yeah, and starting a new trend as usual. As usual. But uh, I mean, he's already invented alternative rock, so now he's changing I mean, how movies it, are. Named. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. No, I know this year they said that he he. Tra- he did some traveling. This was the f- he appeared at Comic Con this year in San Diego. 
which is pretty cool. That would have been amazing. Oh, yeah. This is like uh, the famous instance where he met Robert Crumb and said, hello, Robert. And Crumb like almost lost his mind because he couldn't believe Schultz knew who he was. (laughs) Wow. That's 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 amazing. Uh, He also goes to Oregon this year to do research for uh, the feature Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, which is shows you how far in advance they are working because I don't think that movie came out until like four years. Uh, 77, later, that comes 73 out. 73 years later, yeah. So mm-hmm. that's uh, that's impressive. So he's he's doing some traveling because you know, he's kind of been known for a guy who hated travel. So I thought it was interesting that he is traveling. Uh, I'm wondering if Jeannie's going with him as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I, love, I love Marcy's little dejected head in the lower left corner of the last panel. You can just... <laughs> You know, she's just cut off at the chin. <laughs> it's like she's drowning in this madness. Now that we've seen Marcy for a few years, what do you guys think of Marcy? I like Marcy. I like her. She she is not doing a whole lot this year. I like your take on her being slightly neurodivergent. And I think she is. That little blank look at the I mean, not having eyeballs so it really does to it. that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting how stoic she can be, but at other times how actually absolutely animated she can be with with happy. Uh, mm-hmm. Not so much happy. Her happiness is she has those moments in there, but they tend to be smaller moments. But she can get really angry, as we're going to see shortly. <laughs> uh, and she already we saw her beat up old T ball last year. So yeah, right. That was yeah. She uh, she she warns you when she's going to get angry. She she yes. plans it. And she again, schedules she, it. All right. It's not, she will put up with things to a point. I think less so than the others. I mean, Charlie Brown would put up with T-Bowl till he was 90. It would be like a back to the future situation with Biff, you know, but Marcy's like day two. No, no, no. Yeah. She's like, I'm going to become angry on Thursday. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's unique for the, these characters, I think. So March 21st. Now, what has happened here is Marcy has been trying to pull Peppermint Patty off the doghouse to get her to go to school, and it has destroyed the doghouse. So the doghouse is destroyed. Marcy looks at it. She's disheveled. She says, wow. And then from the rubble, Peppermint Patty pops up and says, all right, Marcy, I hope you're satisfied. You've destroyed Chuck's guest cottage. We see Snoopy's little feet sticking out from the rubble. (laughs) And... Marcy has had enough, and she says, It's not a guest cottage, sir. It's a dog house. And Snoopy is not a funny-looking kid with a big nose. He's a beagle. When are you going to face up to reality? Then in the last panel, Peppermint Batty looks at Snoopy's feet sticking out from the rubble and says, A beagle? And Snoopy says, Woof. (laughs) (laughs) How come he's not falling onto the pool table? (laughs) <laughs> that's the basement that's below there yeah i'm concerned about the van gogh mm-hmm. uh, yeah, or, I mean, or has that already been burned up i forget <laughs> yeah now it's an andrew wyatt that's, that's all in wyatt. the rec room below i'm sure there's a door that's fine the okay. rec well it is a rec room there oh, I guess it's all falling apart <sighs> but i, I like that uh, Mars- <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to see how silent i could make <laughs> <laughs> I like how Marcy is is laying into reality with Peppermint Patty, but is still calling Peppermint I, Patty sir while sir, saying it. I, I was going to say that. <laughs> Brilliant. Right? Yeah. Because we can always see everybody else's problems. Always. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you you may know what others don't, but you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, we're going to go back one after that uh, because I didn't want to interrupt the flow of that sequence. But March 17th is a Sunday and we see uh, there's going to be a show of some sort because there's a curtain uh, (laughs) perched atop Snoopy's doghouse. And then in the next panel, Snoopy has begun the show and we see what looks like a man with a mustache and a Russian hat. Uh, And now there's two little puppets, uh, two different characters that he's waving around. And he continues to do this through all the panels. Charlie Brown and Lucy are watching this show. Lucy says to Charlie Brown, you know what? And Charlie Brown says, what? Now Snoopy even has one on his foot. <laughs> he actually has a Nap- Napoleon puppet on his foot. <laughs> 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 Lucy says, six hours is a long time to stand here. Charlie Brown says, that's true. And then the last panel with Snoopy now balancing four different puppets, Charlie Brown says, but where else are you going to see War and Peace performed with hand puppets? <laughs> 
great drawing of Snoopy doing this with the puppets. And great drawing of Napoleon. Oh my gosh, Napoleon <laughs> the, the puppet is a brilliant drawing. It makes me think of those uh, Mighty Manfred, the Tom Terrific uh, <laughs> cartoons from the early 60s where they were on Captain Kangaroo. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, there's actually a collection. Uh, those were, that was created by Gene Deitch, uh, who was a cartoonist and father of uh, Kim Deitch, who a lot of people know. Um, oh, you're pronouncing it right. Yeah, well, yeah. And uh, I had German in high school, so I know. Yeah, me too. And he created uh, it as a uh, Tom Terrific as a comic strip first called Terrible Thompson. And it, it ran for just a few months, but you can get the collection of them from Fanographics. And it's a really neat, it's that UPA style, super modernist look, but it's a really fun comic strip. Yeah, it was done by Terry Tunes, not too far from where I live in New Rochelle, New York. New Rochelle, home of the Dick Van Dyke uh, characters. You know, New Rochelle claims, yeah, claims Carl and Rob Reiner. Yep. And Mighty Mouse. I think I like And New had Rochelle to succeed in That's business big. without really trying. Oh, wow. What are you talking about? New Rochelle. What about So everything's coming up New Rochelle. Mm -hmm. March 31st. So Marcy is standing in front of uh, the baseball bench, and she's holding a sign that says, Play me, trade me, forget me, who cares? In the next panel, she's looking off panel and says, Oh, no. And Peppermint Patty comes up. She's holding a bat in her hand and she tosses Marcy a baseball glove. And she says, guess what, Marcy? I've decided to give you a try at center field this year. Marcy says, I don't play baseball, sir. Peppermint Patty says, I think you'll be a real natural. Marcy says, I hate games, sir. Peppermint Patty sends her out to the outfield and says, why don't you just trot out there on your little Billie Jean King legs and we'll see what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy says, I can't do anything, sir, because I hate baseball. Peppermint Patty is ignoring it totally. And she is holding the ball and the bat because she's going to hit a few fly balls out to Marcy. She says, just remember, Marcy, that winning is everything and losing is nothing. Marcy says, I don't agree, sir. Winning just doesn't mean that much to me. Peppermint Patty hits the fly ball out to her with a mighty swing, saying, OK, there's a nice high one. Get under it fast and then wing it on home. Marcy does just that, making what looks like a great play, and says, I have no interest in getting under it fast and winging it on home. Then, <laughs> as she prepares to wing it on home, she yells, I don't play baseball, sir. Then, in the next panel, she fires at home, actually knocking Peppermint Patty over, Charlie Brown style. Peppermint Patty yells, the job's yours, Marcy. Congratulations. Then, from the ground, Peppermint Patty looks up and says, by the way, just because I'm the manager doesn't mean you have to call me sir. And Marcy says, yes, sir. Sigh. This so is good. one of Marcy's best moments. <laughs> yeah. And I love the fact that, I mean, there are people in this world who will not listen to what you're saying, <laughs> which I encounter all the time. It's like people always say, like, you should really listen to this obscure blues record. It's great. And I go, like, I don't like blues. <laughs> yeah, well, then, yeah, you know, on the That's because you haven't tried this blues record. <laughs> I know you hate mashed potatoes, but these mashed potatoes <laughs> blow your mind. Well, Peppermint Patty, that's one of her central, I think, character traits is that she really will steamroll people and she in a Snoopy like way kind of, but maybe more forceful. She really insists on her version of reality. Yeah. It's also interesting to me that Marcy as this newer character is the counterpoint to this massive amount of sports strips that Schultz has been putting in. I'm guessing he may have gotten a little feedback from people saying, Hey, hold back on the sports strips. And he's letting Marcy maybe, uh, be the uh, avatar for those people. Yeah, it was almost, I mean, how many was it last year? Well over 100, right? Yeah. No, oh, yeah. It's serious major league sport here all the time. This is the year after I, I gave up on sports, absolutely. And I wonder if Schultz was affected by the fact the Giants traded Willie Mays. I think he was affected by the fact that you had gave up on sports. <laughs> That's what it was. He's like, if Michael's out, I'm out. Yeah. You know, it's so need liberating. Not to give a damn about any sport at any time. <laughs> well, that's true about so many things in life, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Like, every once in a while, you know, you're scrolling through social media, and everyone's really upset about who's playing Batman. And <laughs> it's so great to literally, you could not care less. 
it's wonderful. Yeah, I remember someone was like, why aren't you into sports? And I'm like, well, you know, if somebody wins and somebody loses, the average is always going to be 50% for the teams if you if you put it all together. So it's like you can't get anywhere with it. That's a weird way to look at it. Yeah, I like that. You guys are both weird. <laughs> But we all knew that. Hey, you know what else we know? We know that it's now time for a break uh, because I need to get some water and a snack. And uh, you guys can do that, too. So uh, why don't you go do that? And uh, we'll come back on the other side and uh, go back to the strips. Sure. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. We all love listening to Jimmy describe what's going on in a peanut strip. But did you know that comics are actually a visual medium? That's right. You can see them anytime you want at GoComics.com or in your very own copy of The Complete Peanuts, available from Fanographics. Plus, if you sign up for our monthly newsletter, you'll know in advance which strips we're talking about each week. Learn more about The Great Peanuts Reread at UnpackingPeanuts.com. Okay, we're back. Let's get right back to it. April 11th, Marcy and Peppermint Patty are going for a walk and the neighborhood through some trees peppermint patty says i'm trying marcy but i'm still doing lousy in school marcy says maybe you need to eat a better breakfast sir or have your eyes checked or start going to bed earlier peppermint patty is frustrated she turns to marcy and says you've never understood have you marcy that when a person complains he doesn't want a solution he wants sympathy then marcy says no i admit i never understood that sir Peppermint Patty says, stop calling me, sir. You probably should stop using he when you're discussing. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> Although I guess that right? was cons- well, then No wonder Marcy's confused. Yeah, Marcy, you know, uh, Peppermint Patty might have herself to blame there. <laughs> Luckily, it doesn't affect their friendship. Yes. <laughs> and that is a good thing to learn, uh, what Peppermint oh, Patty's trying to so share with important. Marcy. This is so true. Yeah. It is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, sometimes you want a solution, but... Never. Never. <laughs> there are no <laughs> solutions, just misery. Who the hell wants to actually do something? I, I think the worst thing... It's, it's when you, you're initially... It's all about the vibe. You can tell when a person's just complaining, you know? And then you can tell when a person's like, I really don't know what to Unless do. Unless you're Marcy, and then maybe you can't. Unless you're Marcy. Or me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> April 29th. Well, you know what the problem is? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you don't say anything. If you just said That's something, right. you'd solve. Oh, never mind. I know. Oh, well, how many problems we would solve by just simple, direct, clear, and honest communication? What? Oh, most of them. <laughs> but who's going to do that, Harold? Come on. That's crazy talk. <laughs> April 29th. It's a movie line. And in this particular movie line, we see Sally, Linus, Franklin and Pat. possibly Pat. the back of, of Patty, <laughs> original Patty. Oh, you say movie line? I thought it was like frankly, my Scarlet. <laughs> <laughs> Sally says, "Is there a lot of throwing up in this movie?" <laughs> She's saying this to Linus. She continues, "I'm not going to pay good money just to watch some stupid actor throw up." <laughs> she continues. Now she's annoyed. If I want to watch someone throw up, I can watch the kid who lives next door to us. He is the flu. <laughs> then Linus leaves saying, I'm going home. All your talk is making me sick. <laughs> Sally throws her arms out and says, don't go. Maybe there won't be any throwing up. Maybe there'll just be killing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a veiled Linda Blair reference, isn't it? Well, did people throw up before then in movies? I think. I'm certain someone threw up somewhere before th- the ex. I think it was probably a discreet, to... I'm going to be sick and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the old over the side of the ocean yes. liner gag mm. with the finger over the ex- expanded cheeks. <laughs> I have to say, I agree with Sally. I do not like watching someone throw up on screen. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I, I, I don't know if you guys nominated this one, but I, I definitely did. I just, Sally, this made me laugh so much. <laughs> <laughs> just going off on it, and, and and I think she just did uh, Linus some a service if if she's correct, you know. <laughs> so you really don't need to see all that pea soup. You can just you know just buy some Liptons and save some money. May sixth, 
Joe Cool is hanging around the dorm. And he says, here's Joe Cool hanging around the dorm. <laughs> In the next panel, we see him taking off his sunglasses. And he thinks, Joe Cool always keeps up with the latest campus fads. In the next panel, we see him laying his sunglasses on the ground and removing his collar and saying, and what's the latest campus fad? And then in the last panel, we see Snoopy sans collar <laughs> running and saying, streaking! <laughs> well, the 70s, like, naked 70s Snoopy. Never, never let up. It was like fad after uh, fad. <laughs> yeah, he likes to show off his physique. <laughs> <laughs> it is an endless... There are tons of, of fads in the 70s, right? I mean, streaking was a fad. CB radio Pet rocks. was a fad. Mood Pet rings. Rocks. The mood rings, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a thing called lids where you'd put them in your eyelids to like prop your eyelids open and they were like decorative. That didn't last very long. Wow. I don't know about that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They showed it on the PM magazine. Oh, okay. And well, that, yeah. Well, then there was Lidsville. <laughs> that I know about. Sure. That, that I call it uh, bad. I think I think it's it's you know we're now ten years out from the height of the British invasion and all that kind of excitement, the sixties excitement, and I think people are now like it's been ten years. What's the next thing going to be? And they're trying to make it happen, <laughs> trying to make something happen, and it's just not happening. <laughs> May tenth, Peppermint Patty is thrilled. She runs up to Marcy, saying, "Marcy, look, I got an N." She's holding a piece of paper with this on it. And then in the next panel, she's holding it, looking at it. She's so proud. She says, I got an N on my English test. That's the highest grade I've ever gotten. Marcy says, it's not an N, sir. That's a Z. You have the paper <laughs> turned sideways. Poor Peppermint Patty is now crestfallen. And she says, rats, for one brief, exciting moment, I thought I had an N. <laughs> Punchline sounds very familiar. For one brief shining moment. One brief shining moment is from Camelot. No, no, no. I think that there's he used that in Peanuts for one brief exciting moment. I thought I'd. It's like Charlie Brown, like did something, like the kite flew or something. I can't remember. So you think you think that ter- brief exciting moment is a is a Peanuts term yes, that has I been do. used before? All right, uh, listeners out there, find it. Okay, if you could find where uh, Charlie Brown or someone said a brief exciting moment, uh, let us know. May 29th. Linus and Lucy are hanging out uh, outside. Linus is in classic thumb and blanket position, and Lucy says, Linus, do you think I should have my ears pierced? Linus says, I have a better idea. Why don't you have your mouth boarded up? <laughs> Panel three, Lucy just slaps him. Pow! But then from the ground, Linus, a big grin on his face, says, that was worth one hit. Two hits, no. But it was definitely <laughs> worth one hit. Ah, uh, yes. This is this really takes me back to the good old days. <laughs> when he was getting slugged all the time for snarky remarks. I love how she looks so calm in panel one. And then the next time we see her in panel three, it's just pure violence. <laughs> She goes from zero to 100. <laughs> Look at the word balloon, the left-hand side of the word balloon in panel one, and you really start seeing that shake Ooh, in that line. Yes, you do. Uh, yeah, and that feels like a tremor to me as opposed to a choice. Yeah. Uh, and you will be seeing that more and more. And the first place you start to see it, I think, is actually in the word balloon. Uh, when did he start doing that on the on the boards on the side of the doghouse where he, he'll he'll go – for a, a very brief run of the line and he'll start it over again and do it. So you see it like four different, you know, takes of the line of that board instead of it just going all the way across as a single move. Cause I've been noticing that this year, but I didn't know if he, mm. it, he had been doing it all along, but it was, it was more controlled or. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what you're, you're referring to. You're talking about like the, the lines on the, Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, Cause I'm looking at the, the puppet show thing. Yeah. As opposed to one line that goes across, he's doing it like a third of the way. Then another extension of the mm-hmm. line. Is that what yeah, you're yeah, exactly. About? Yeah. Or, or, or he's yeah, maybe yeah, never, he know. never lifts the pen, but he, he, he moves it. Then he moves it Stops. again, moves it again. Yeah. And, and each time the line has just a slightly different arc or angle mm-hmm. to it. And you can see where the ink might pool just a tiny bit, but that's, that's yeah, a, new, sure. a new thing. Oh, and Michael, by the way, yeah. Um, I, before you said other people look it up, you you are not crazy. That brief 
exciting moment has appeared at least twice before. Really? Whoa! W- with the same go. gag, Michael with Cohen. the same gag, <laughs> the same line, really? the same full line from fi- it was fifty one and fifty nine. So it, that that goes back a ways. Uh oh. So what do you, do you, do you have the oh, actual wow. punchline? I do. Yeah. What is it? The, it was uh, well the the first nineteen fifty one Charlie Brown. I'm I'm on the five cents please website, but it says um. The, the strip is, it says Charlie Brown looks at his face closely in a mirror and then reports to Violet that it turned out only to be dirt, but for one brief exciting moment, I thought I needed a yes. shave. And then in 59, Linus looks at himself in a hand mirror, decides he's only, he's only seeing a little dirt and reports to Lucy for one brief exciting moment, I thought I needed a shave. So he did it twice. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, there you go. Well, actually, since we just saw Linus getting slapped upside the head, do you want to do the anger meter? Uh, sure. We can do the anger meter. So, what do you guys think? How does this year feel to you? Does it feel mm-hmm. angrier or happier? I mean, this, this anger is only in one panel. Does that make the whole strip right. angry? I, no. How do you not know the rules I to don't this? Know yes, let's we'll go over the rules <laughs> once more for our new listeners. There should be one, so, one quarter oh of a panel. No. Is if a strip shows anger, but is this happiness too? Because he's happy in the last panel. Yes, yes. Is it both? Yes. It's yeah. It yes. can be both. So basically, the anger the anger uh, count that I'm doing every year, I've been doing every year, is if at least one character in one panel is showing what I would consider to be anger, I will count that as a strip that has anger in it. And if the strip shows a character uh, who is happy for even just one panel, okay. I will consider that happiness. So I'm just trying to be consistent throughout. I just love that Michael does not know the rules, but consistently is right. I completely <laughs> understand the rules. I have gotten it right twice. Oh, but they're not well, my rules, so I don't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I'll go back to 1973. So... We uh, we were down to I think we were we had seventy three angry strips, which is just twenty percent of the strips had a character showing anger, which is really low for the strip, and uh, ninety two or twenty five percent for showing happiness. So, if we were twenty percent seventy three, how many do you think? Where are we in seventy four? Does it feel any different? I'd to say sixty four. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Jimmy? I uh, think that overall, this is going... I, you know what? I think we're holding steady. Holding steady. Well, the number has gone from 73 to 95. No way! 26% of the strips are angry, and then the happiness index was at 92 and 25%. What do you think we are this year? I think we're holding steady. <laughs> 93. <laughs> Oh, you're not not far off. It's 102, so it's up 3%. Right. So it, this kind of goes with my theory, and we have been talking about this before. Schultz had been going through an awful lot in his life, and he'd just gone through a divorce. And this is the first full year he is remarried. He's kind of building a new life for himself. He's moved to a new place. And I, I just get the sense that he's he's maybe a little bit freer with his emotions, than he had been earlier, and we're seeing a little bit more of that in the characters. It seems like my sense is in the earlier strips, when a character showed anger, you had the sense that the anger was maybe wrong. You know, you, there, there was this kind of that underlying sense that it's it's not right for the character to be angry. Here, I I, I just get the sense he's letting the characters, if they're angry, he just lets them be angry. He's not there's there's not a an underlying sense of, you know, well, this, you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't show emotion like that. I don't know if that makes any sense. I sense a doctoral thesis at work here. <laughs> oh, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> June 17th. Oh, this one's very important in my life. Panel one, pow! Charlie Brown gets leveled by a, uh, a line drive. He's flying on the pitcher's mound. All his clothes have have left him except his little shorts. In the next panel, we see Lucy running after what should be a fly ball, but is in fact Charlie Brown's shoe. (laughs) She catches it. She catches it. (laughs) Which is amazing, right? She comes back and she says, look, Charlie Brown, I caught your shoe. And Charlie Brown, sitting on the mound in just his shorts, says, maybe I should pitch my shoe instead of the ball. Then Lucy walks away saying, that's a good idea. Give him the old knuckle shoe. (laughs) 
This was on the cover of my uh, my the front of my uh, my lunch can my uh, my my lunchbox for for kids. This was the name of my my doctoral thesis. <laughs> All right, the, old, the knuckle old knuckle shoe. Knuckle shoe. So I looked at this every single day for like I think two years. I used that lunch can, and so I mean I like stared. I think that first drawing is one of the funniest drawings anybody's ever done. Like, I really like how ridiculous the toes are. <laughs> if, like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, I studied this in the way only a kid can study something forever. It, it's like having the same cereal it. box for two years. Yeah, right, right. And I loved, I loved that lunchbox. And so, thanks, Dad. <laughs> and I loved this strip. I thought it was really cute. <laughs> and you know what else I love? I love hanging out with you guys and talking comics. And I love that we have so many listeners who are out there listening every week, more and more every week. And I'm so grateful for that. We know it's not because of our charming personalities. It's because of Mr. Schultz. But still, it means a lot that you guys uh, are tuning in and listening. Um, So thank you. Uh, We're going to break it right here for 1974. And we're going to come back next week and finish the rest of them. But if you want to hang out with the gang between now and then, what you can do is you could go on our website, unpackingpeanuts.com, and you can send us an email and sign up for the Great Peanuts Reread. You can uh, find us on Instagram and Twitter, where we're at Unpack Peanuts, or Facebook, where we're Unpacking Peanuts. And we would love to hear from you. What do you think about the 70s? What do you think about us? What do you think about (laughs) that motorcycle that's driving by? (laughs) Whatever you have to say, we want to hear it. Um, so, yeah, other than that, come back next week. <laughs> now there's a jackhammer. <laughs> All right. So we're doing a lot of work here on the Ameliaverse. So, anyway, come back next week. What? Until then, I can't hear it. What? Michael and Harold. I'm Jimmy. Be of good yes. cheer. Be of good Be cheer. cheer. Yeah. <laughs> Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. Unpacking Peanuts on Facebook and YouTube. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. Woof.